The next one is the director of International Institute for Advanced Sustainable Studies and uh, Professor uh, Owen Rand. He was uh, president of a society of risk assessment, which I was uh, affiliate years ago when we have a meeting in Taiwan and he couldn't. So you uh, send a video for us and, uh, and two years ago came again. Two years ago, right? Uh, yeah. So um, it will be good and uh, to listen to his talk because he put digitization and sustainable development in the middle is a globalization. That's uh, uh, truly the, the, the kind of trend we have experienced for the past three decades. So uh, Owen, yours. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, distinguished audience, ladies and gentlemen. It's a delight for me to talk to you this morning about the three major transformations that I think we're all experiencing. And the three major transformations are digitalization, it's globalization, and its sustainable development. Those are the three deliberately designed transitions, and that's why I call them transformation. Transitions are just changes that happen to us. Transformations are changes that we make. And I think that's a very important difference. This is where we have agency. All of those, the three of them, are not coming by themselves. They need human action they need policy and they need implementation. But the point is that although all three are engineered, are designed, they are not free of conflicts between each other. And that's one of our great challenges in the world, that we have three communities pushing for globalization, for digitalization, and for sustainable development that are not in harmony with each other. Yes, sometimes they have synergies, sometimes they have not. And I would like to address this issue in more detail. Let me first start out with what we mean with the three major transformation waves. The first thing is globalization. And globalization doesn't mean everything gets more international. That is, have been done for a long period of time. It's really that space is not really important anymore for production, trade, and communication. Uh, we can communicate with everyone in the world instantly, and we can have emails that go anywhere, and it doesn't matter whether that person is next door, or next to us sitting, or 10,000 miles away. We have trade systems that bring goods from one place to the other, and as a matter of fact, the cost of transportation is almost marginal. Uh, we can look at this and you can see that with today's transportation systems, it doesn't make much of a difference whether something is produced in Taiwan and exported to Germany or produced in Taiwan and exported next door. Uh, actually, the increase of cost is marginal. And so uh, it's really what we can see is that space is almost not important anymore when it comes to economics and also to communication, and that has a lot of implications in terms of competitiveness, a lot of implications in terms of developing a global culture. The second point is digitalization, and uh, Ilan already made a couple of very important points. There are three major applications here. One is production and uh, industry 4.0, as you call it in Germany. It is that machines communicate with each other and have also decision-making power. It's not just that they do manual work, they actually decide what to do, what priorities they take. So machines can communicate with each other and uh, humans are only partially involved in that. We have whole set of service economy that comes into play, robots, uh, artificial intelligence that also can deal with new types of services that in a sense can be done outside of uh, human activity, and thirdly, consumption, not something we call about smart environments, smart urban um, installations, uh, all the you know, um, 
smartphones and everything else that you're using has really changed our life, our communication styles, but also the way that we interact with our environment. And then we have a word that I invented, sustainabilization, because there's an Asian at the end of each of those. So um, sustainable development. And that is really, we're talking about natural resources. Uh, they are getting scarce. And we're talking about sink capacity, which is meaning that our emissions really go beyond the threshold of what nature can actually tolerate. Uh, it's about social and economic justice, when we talk about the economic aspects of sustainability and collective and individual identity. So those are the three major transformations, and that's kind of the applications in which they are um, manifesting themselves. Um, and there are accompanying trends. Uh, a trend is something that's not manufactured. It is a side effect of these three major transformations and others. And this is just a selection. It's not exclusive or comprehensive. So we can see that along with these transformations, we get a specific set of trends. Uh, one trend is demographic changes, and aging is an issue that is, of course, is also very important in Taiwan. We have growing and shrinking populations. We have growing populations in Africa, shrinking populations in Europe. Uh, we have the whole increase of urbanization within the next 30 years. More than 50% of the population will live in cities with more than 100,000 inhabitants. Uh, and we have an increased mobility. So some people move around and we see a lot of migration, uh, partially also caused by some of the environmental damages that I've talked about. And we have these global environmental changes, specifically climate change, loss of biodiversity, diversity, land use patterns, and other planetary boundaries of which uh, uh, Ilana just made a few very visible when he talked about the 2050 program. So we can see those are the things that are kind of the accompanying music with all these transformations, and we have to deal with them. It's kind of unattended side effects. Some of them are well known. Other well, we still need to explore more. Now, when we talk now a little bit more about the three waves, and what I wanted to point out again is there are some synergies between the three transformations, but there are also conflicts. There are contradictions. And that is something where we see that you know, society is getting nervous about them, or that we see we need them more agency, or more policy, or more consensus among people to make sure that they take the right action. Now, if you talk about uh, globalization, I've already made it very clear, space becomes relevant for production, trade, and communication. Um, that is a very new experience for humankind. Uh, um, you know, until the 1950s, basically space was one of the most important aspects of it. The interesting thing is that our feeling is still very strongly related to space. So what we call home country or homeland is something which is very often related to space, but at the same time, the economic system really gets beyond space, and that, of course, creates a lot of tensions. Uh, we have the emphasis on competitiveness on a global scale. Uh, for many, many centuries, if you were competitive within a you know, space of 50 miles around your production, that was fine. Uh, now you are competing with people around the world. And it doesn't matter what you produce, there's somebody else who produces something very similar. So it puts a lot of emphasis on efficiency and international division of labor. And that's something where you can see that changes are going very rapidly because if some country or some uh, region has a cutting edge in one of those technologies, you know, they have a competitive advantage over everybody else. And the third thing is universalization of lifestyles. I mean, if you look uh, around you, you all dressed very similarly. Uh, and if you go wherever you want, you'll find almost the same kind of dresses. Um, that's something that is interesting to see that universalization of lifestyles as much as we like the kind of native home country relationship, but still there's a lot of international lifestyle that has more or less secretly or subtly influenced our thinking, our way of living. Uh, if you look at furniture, if you look at uh, cooking styles, yes, it becomes very diverse, but the diversity is everywhere. 
So that's something that is um, interesting. So you have an emergence of global values and behavioral routines. That's good and bad, or depending on what you look at. We have a dominance of markets in everyday life because of this competitiveness game, and a very strong emergence of a popular global culture. Uh, if you look at uh, popular music or so on, it's basically very much the same, with a little bit of folklore uh, installed in, uh, uh, in the various countries. Now, if you go to digitalization, again, we see a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of potential risks and uh, potential dangers. Uh, there are opportunities you see here that, uh, and uh, Ilan mentioned it, this, of course, part of the globalization game, and here you see a synergy, is competitiveness, and with digital equipment and digitalization of production lines, you can get more competitive products and production lines. So that's something where digitization pushes globalization at the same time. Uh, it's automation of manual, but also of these positive activities. That's something that is really interesting, that now machines make decisions. And that, of course, creates a lot of problems. We have done service in Germany, and some of the workers working in these fields say that they see a conflict. They believe X should be done. The machine thinks Y should be done. So who has the last word? That's not an easy question. And one of the workers told me when he had that problem, he just pulled the plug. <laughs> so that's one way of getting that decision made. No, it was not in the sense of the employer to do that. But nevertheless, you get that kind of issues. And you know, I think you need to think about this in advance. So if there is a conflict between a worker saying, no, it should be done this way, the machine says, no, it should be done that way. So who had the last word? And that's not a trivial a question, by the way. It's also a question of dignity. It's a question of, you know, how you value human judgment compared to the judgment of the machine. Um, so that's something that's important. Increase of information access. We're just, you know, having an you know, abundance of data. Um, you know, there's trillions of data being stored. People normally don't know what to do with all the data. I mean, a lot of manufacturers tell me, we have now all the data, but we don't know what to do with it. Um, and that's something that is also coming up, and of course there's a lot of danger in all this data collection, but also a lot of opportunities. And uh, we have an increase in comfort and convenience. I mean, why do we all use the smartphones? Why do we have all these smart devices at our house? The, you know, today in the world, the most sold equipment is mobile phones. It used to be transistor radio, now it's mobile phones. And if wherever, wherever you go, I mean, if you go in the middle of Africa or somewhere in the middle of the bushes, people have a phone. And that's something that's interesting. So it really has a strong attractiveness to people. So yes, there is something there that certainly have you know, a strong impact on our life, and it actually eases a lot of our life. But there are risks. First risk, of course, is vulnerability. Everything is interconnected, so cyber security is a huge problem. And since it's global, it's one of those whole systemic risks that you have to deal with because if somebody has the ability to have the worldwide net collapse, well, you can imagine what kind of consequences it would have. And we have always this cat and mouse game, who is a little quicker, the people who safeguard uh, our equipment and our nets and those who attack them. And if we get self-propelling and, and automated cars that are autonomous, one of the real issue is, well, there will be a lot of hackers who like to see that all the traffic lights go to red or that all the brakes are failing. Um, and, you know, that gives you, you know, egomanic power. Uh, and how do you want to prevent that? Uh, it's not that easy because if everybody else can have in, can get to your car, if you if the traffic light can communicate with your car, you know, a hacker can do that too. So, you know, and we've been working on this, by the way. It's, it's a very uh, tricky issue to deal with this. Displacement of jobs and profession was mentioned before by you. I will strongly believe that quantitatively we'll get more jobs than losing. And that's just, you know, plain economics. If it's more efficient, you have more money, so you can employ more people. But it will be a major transition from the jobs we have now to the jobs that we'll have in the future. So a lot of people will be out of work and we will look for people with specific talents and specific training that we don't get. 
And that's, uh, so we need a transition period in which we train people towards a new economy. And that will take time. You can't do this overnight. And I think that's one of the things that I would also push the German government to do, to say, look, try mentoring program, try training programs. You know, people that are now working in many of the manufacturing, but also a lot of service jobs, will not be needed in 10 years. So you have to retrain them now, because if they're once they're unemployed, it's very difficult to retrain them. So that's um, important. Cybersecurity, I said about it. Loss of privacy, sovereignty, a big issue. If you know what's going to do with the data, I said that. You will you'll provide millions of data about yourself in a worldwide net, more than you ever think you do. And you, everybody can make a profile out of you if you have all the data that you have there. Now you can say, well, who cares? But you know, if you have a, a strong sickness and your insurance company knows about it and cancels your insurance policy, well, that's not something you would like to see. And so there's a lot of things where privacy really has major impact on your life, on your security, on, you know, on a lot of things that you value. So they need to have there some regulation. And the last thing is polarization of values and attitudes, the thing that I think is extremely important. Um, a lot of these digital, or let's better say, uh, virtual communication channels provide always reinforcement for whatever your prejudices are. That's what we call echo chamber. So if you believe um, that whatever uh, Taiwan lies on the moon, um, you'll find in the internet someone who also thinks that. And Google will know that you like to see that, and so it will put always in the first three, um, um, you know, um, what pops up on your screen. And over time, you believe everybody believes that, and that is a real dangerous thing because what we can see in politics right now is more and more polarization, and polarization is partially fueled by our social media practice that we only want to reinforce what we already believe. But that is a situation in which we don't learn. You can only learn if you have the experience of difference. You know, if, if you just get support what you already know, that's not learning. And we're getting more and more into the space if we're just trying to reinforce what our beliefs are. And that is being strongly supported by the way that our um, search machines are operating right now. So there is a, a real problem here. We need to take care of this. Now get to the third one, sustainabilization uh, and sustainable development, as that the word is being invented. Um, and we see the three major dimensions here. First, the ecological, and we talked about this, I think there are the three major elements that we need in terms of uh, ecological movement towards sustainability, which is decarbonization, uh, energy, but also our food production is very strongly based on putting more carbon into the atmosphere. Dematerialization, meaning we need to do all our economic productivity and all of our activities with less material and less energy. And renaturalization basically means that we have to be sure that we have enough space there for our co-creations and co-creatures, better say, um, um, that also inhabits the world. And now we'll have a lot of natural spaces left because we need them, but also it's a part of, uh, of the overall creation. Economic terms, sustainability means more circular economy. It's also supporting dematerialization and renaturalization and that we internalize all external effects so that the price really tells us the true ecological value of something. And uh, that's something that is still far away from this. And social cultural, it's very important to think about intra and intergenerational justice. Uh, again, that was mentioned uh, by you, uh, saying that we are getting more inequities. Picketing was uh, uh, being uh, um, referenced just um, a, a few minutes ago. Uh, we see a stronger gap between the 10% poorest and the 10% richest people in every country in the world. There's hardly any exception. And um, the poor are getting richer, but the rich are getting much faster richer and more richer than the poor are get a little richer. And so the distance is widening and widening, and that, of course, is an in invitation for social unrest. So we need to be very careful about this, and that's also part of digitalization because you know the jobs that are being displaced, if they go into the unemployment, 
you have again an increase of the gap between the rich and the poor and the ones that are very well suited for the digital economy earn billions of euros or whatever and the other ones nothing. So we need a redistribution here of public wealth. Uh, it's participation in collective affairs to have agency in collective decision making. A very important element of sustainability. Not a passive consumer that actually just consumes and leaves everything else to policymakers. No, it's participatory, inclusive governance that we are looking at and maintaining cultural identity. Again, you see there that there are some conflicts here with the uh, globalization paradigm. So. I said there are conflicts out there, and I think we have to address these conflicts. It's not that conflict is something bad. You know, we often think we should avoid conflict. Well, if you can avoid it in advance by addressing the reasons for the conflict, that's fine. But once the conflict is there, we need to think about the conflict. Ignoring conflicts is never helping to resolve them. So we need to think about them and have to make deliberate choices. It's a deliberate choice element here. For example, on gross versus non-gross society, sustainability would go to non-gross development, yes, but non-gross. Globalization goes to growth, very clearly. There is a clear distance here. Uh, free global markets, that's something globalization really loves. National protectionism is something that is totally against that, and some of the sustainability movements go for more national or niche production. Again, there is a clear distinction here. And autonomy of the individual, uh, so you know, have an autonomous individual versus interdependence, that's something that also leads between digitalization and maybe um, sustainability. But there are also different relative weights. It means it's not a, a principal conflict here, but it's something, it's a degree to which something is here. For example, the global economy really puts efficiency first. So everything is efficiency. Now, we're not saying efficiency is not good. I mean, efficiency is extremely important, but it's not all what counts. We want to look into effectiveness. Is it effective? We have to look into resilience. Is it resilient? And we have to look into fairness. So there are four elements that we need to address. Effectiveness, is it effective what we're doing? Is it efficient? Is it resilient? And is it fair? Those are four major elements, and I think if we can get a balance between the four, then we can actually reach a good conflict resolution between globalization, digitalization, and sustainable development. There is the issue of weak versus strong sustainability. Can we substitute artificial products for natural products? And again, it's not a yes-no answer. You know, we always do this, but at the end of degree, is an artificial swimming pool just as good as a natural lake? That's a question. Uh, in economics, very often we say, well, it's the same need, swimming and refreshing, so who cares whether it's natural or not? Well, we do care. And so in a sense, it's important to, to take that question, how much substitution is possible? The degree of centralization. Globalization said no decentralization doesn't make any sense. We are on a co big competitive game here. Sustainable development says, no, we need to decentralize. In the energy system, very clearly, decentralized systems have you know, a better sustainable performance than highly centralized systems. But they're not that efficient. So we have that kind of um, conflicting goal. Degree of state intervention into markets. Again, globalization would say, no, the state should get out of this. The market will c control everything. Well, the market will create a lot of inequities. That's the market is blind against justice. That's not what the market is doing. I mean, you can't blame the market for it because it even doesn't pretend to do it. But if a society thinks just distribution of resources is an important element, it cannot leave it just to the market. And that seems fairly obvious. And the degree of how we protect privacy rights and open disclosure of, of data, that's another thing where, again, we see the digitalization problem. The digital, let's say, uh, big companies, they want to have you know, access to all the data because that's how they make money. I mean, why is Google free uh, for you? Well, and Google makes a lot of money. Not with you, but with your data. Data is being exchanged into money. The more data you give, the more money they have. That's the business model. And it's not negative. You just have to know about it. 
And if you think, oh, I get something free here as a search machine, you're not free. You give something for it. I mean, Google is not a non-profit company. It's actually a profit company. It makes profit by exchanging data to money, for example, through advertising. So we have these conflicts and we need to deal with these conflicts and I think that makes it very important. So how can we deal with it? And within the political systems, we can have three different ways of dealing with it. One is trying to find a consensus. And I'll say yes, I'm always for that. If that's a, my primary option, all right, thank you, my primary option, but it's hard to reach when we have principal differences. And also, it's very time-consuming and it's very difficult to get actors involved. We could have a majority vote. That, of course, is also a problem. First, you know, the 49% that are not our opinion are always disappointed. So we have always winners and losers. And secondly, preferences change over time. And it, it's very often not a very efficient solution. So a new way of thinking of it is to look into so-called boundary negotiations. So you look for each actor where the boundary, where that actor feels now this is the boundary where it's getting to me very painful. Uh, I cannot go al along with it, but I can tolerate something before that. And if you have the area that each group can tolerate, then you find a space in which everybody says, it's not my first option, but it's an option to which I can still agree. So that's a way of getting along in terms of negotiations about these three transformations. Okay, so that could be synergies, ecology, I made already that, decarbonized, dematerialized, renaturalizing guardrails that govern the limits of free markets. So yes, we have free markets, but we have limits to it. Economy, smart structure with a circular economy, emphasis on service providers, strengthening local and regional economies, so it's not just global, and politics effort to balance the three transformations simultaneously, more deliberative participation and adaptive regulation with e-government. Now, don't go into it, but those are kind of things that where I think we could have compromises on those boundaries that I just uh, expressed before. And uh, so social enforcing rules for digital autonomy and sovereignty, embracing community empowerment, avoiding or compensating inequities, cultural emphasis on cultural diversity, but maintaining local and regional identity, and global multilateral agreements rather than global rules, control of finance markets on a global level, regulation of digital services and rules from a global perspective. Now again, those are just buzzwords, I know that, but they should be taken, yeah, they should be taken seriously in terms of when where to go. That's really what I would like to say. There are these three transformations. They do have conflicts. They do contradict each other. But there is space for compromise. There's space for common action that will somehow you know, link these three transformations together and make them more productive and just for society. So what can we do? And that's m one more slide. Um, embrace all three transformations, but on the condition of accountable and responsible design. That's really my, I think, most important message I want to say. It's not fate. Neither digitalization, nor globalization, nor sustainable development is fate. It's design. And we are the designers. Now, it's difficult for each individual to think of a global designer, but basically we design the future on these three major transformations. And so it's up to us to see how we deal with the conflicts and the contradictions. We need new government strategies that combine these four elements I've said before, effectiveness, efficiency, resilience, and fairness. And we have groups that deal with that more effectively than others. We need to include more direct citizen involvement in developing smart, digital and sustainable life worlds, so really on the regional, on the regional and community level. And we need more effective educational programs that make people understand their opportunities and risks and prepare them for their role in the new information age, specifically in terms of labor. We need to have good retraining programs so that people are better equipped for dealing with the new opportunities but also with the new risks. And I would like to conclude with a quote that I found for the previous um, 
a UN General Secretary, and I think it's a very good quote that I think could be almost like a, um, what an epitaph uh, to what we need. And uh, Kofi Annan, uh, in one of his speeches, said, sustainability is often misunderstood. misunderstood. It does not mean securing what we have. The focus is not on conservation, but on innovation and development. The world needs change, yet this change must obey a different rationale, which is the paradigm of justice with respect to the present and the future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ori. <coughs> so we allow a, a quick question. Uh, anyone? Uh, Dr. Ortin, uh, uh, I am uh, my name is my name is Ryan Zhang. Hmm. Huh. Uh, and I am a graduate of National Diploma and uh, Master Degree of Student. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, I have a question about demography change and digitalization relationship. Yeah. Uh, according to Eric Greenberg, he question of living alone, living alone. He say digitalization in the world, including the internet, and living alone, there is a challenge to globalization. And we could find digitalization, uh, digitalization bring change in family situation and personal reality. I think it's also social impact of digitalization too. Uh, for example, in Germany, couple can live alone and maintain marriage. Uh, may, but maybe Taiwanese nothing. Uh, so how to understand the individual in perception by about by about globalization from digital age. And living alone will be able to individual auto money. Yeah, well, thank you very much. A very important question, of course. Um, let me iterate what I've tried to say. Maybe I should say it even more uh, pronouncedly. Efficiency and globalizations have done a lot of very good things to the human societies. Um, we would not be here in a way that we have developed without that. And there's a lot of regional deficiencies that can be compensated by global trade. Uh, not everything can be produced everywhere. And if you just think about food, and we had a lot of famines all over the history because there was no trade. So if you had you know, bad, very bad weather in a year, people just died. So global trade is, in its sense, progress. However, if global trade is only governed by efficiency, we compromised other major societal values. And that's the main problem. So if you leave it just as a global markets, yes, we will be even more efficient than we are now. But if we don't correspond to other values such as resilience, effectiveness, and specifically fairness, we will miss out on some of the things that societies value for very good reason. And that's why, in my view, we need a market economy that it is controlled by a good governmental regulation. So there's always that you have both forces that kind of keep checks and balances. If you have just the state doing things, the state you know, makes a lot of mistakes, it's not efficient, maybe effective, not efficient. If you just leave it to the market, you violate all the other values except efficiency. So building this kind of check and balance system is extremely important that the globalization is within limits, but that the market can use its creative power to produce the kind of goods and services that are needed to cope with future challenges. Okay. Uh, 
probably we have to move on, and uh, because we still have time to discuss later on. Yes. So can we thanks uh, Owen?